Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're going to take a look at a pistol that was so controversial when it came out that uh, basically the tiny number of gun dealers who decided they might try to sell them were bullied out of selling them by the general public, and only a tiny number of these things actually came into the country to become available. It's a really interesting story, and a ton of people are going to have preconceived notions about it, and I think we're going to have a good time today exploring the various nuances of what was actually behind the Armadix IP-1, uh, and also how it actually works mechanically, because for all the controversy and the coverage of it, there's not a lot out there that shows you what the thing's actually doing. Then we're going to go actually take it out on the range and see how it shoots. So, this, as I already said, is an Armadix IP-1. It's a 22 caliber pistol. It's not really a self-defense pistol, it's not really a target pistol, it's actually not in any way either of those things. It's really a technology demonstrator sort of pistol. And by the way, it doesn't work unless you also have the Armadix IW-1 watch to go with it. So this is one of the early uh, iterations. This is one of the few iterations of a smart gun that almost actually reached the commercial market. There was a lot of interest in this sort of thing in the 1990s and the early 2000s, and it was driven by some legitimate good intentions, things like reducing accidental shootings. You know, if a toddler finds a gun and accidentally pulls the trigger. Well, if you have a gun that can only be fired by an authorized person, one would presume a toddler would not be authorized and thus couldn't pull the trigger, and you could avoid a gun accident. That's a good thing. There was also a lot of interest in coming up with a way to prevent police officers from being shot with their own guns. Um, this is not as uncommon as you might suspect. A uh, police officer gets in a hand-to-hand -hand scuffle with someone, someone then takes their gun and potentially shoots them with it. So the idea was, well what if we can have a police pistol where only the officer is authorized to fire it, so if it leaves his control during, say, a hand-to-hand -hand fight, well he can't be shot by it. Or if someone steals his gun, it can't be shot by whoever stole it. Again, seems like a good idea. Now, where this went awry, and what caused so much trouble for Armadix and every other company that has gotten into this, is specifically a law in New Jersey that was passed that mandated that 30 months after the Attorney General of New Jersey determined that a so-called smart gun was available on the market anywhere in the United States, only smart guns would be legal to sell in New Jersey. Uh, it's a law that was put into effect with the intent of developing this sort of technology to the point where it would be usable. The unintended consequence of it, or maybe the intended consequence for some people, was that once that thing became available, nothing else could be allowed to be sold in New Jersey, which was a huge issue for, well, in particular, people who wanted to own pistols in New Jersey. But it became a major national rallying point in the United States. So the basic story of Armadix here is it was developed by a German engineer. It is a German company. Uh, there are some elements of this that are so incredibly German that we'll touch on as we get to them. But uh, developed by a German engineer by the name of Ernst Mauck. Uh, he was formerly a, I think, a fairly high up uh, weapons designer for H and K, and left H and K in two thousand four, two thousand five. Uh, about a year later joined Armadix and developed this. Now fundamentally the way this works is that there is a, a radio frequency ID chip, an RFID chip, in the gun and in the watch, and the two of them communicate with each other, and the pistol will not fire unless basically it has been authenticated by the watch. So on the watch, in order to shoot the pistol, I have to go into a settings menu, I have to turn on the pistol, and it allows me to select how many hours I would like the pistol to be active for, 1 to 8. Once I do that, then as long as the watch is within about 10 to 20 inches of the pistol, the pistol will fire. If the watch is removed from the vicinity of the pistol, it will not fire. From a technological point of view, this is interesting. Now there are a number of technical problems with the IP-1. Like I said, this is really a, a technology demonstrator. It was not in any serious, any legitimate way intended to be 
any specific sort of practical pistol. The sights and the trigger are way too terrible for it to be a target pistol. Uh, the fact that it's chambered for 22 rim fire means it is not a valid, not not a, a good choice for a self defense pistol. It's there to make this tech not to show this technology working essentially. So, uh, without further ado, let's take a look at how this actually works, and then we'll talk about what happened when it was introduced into the U.S. market. Alrighty, here is the complete package. We've got the gun, we've got the watch, and we've got the manual. Now I don't normally include the manual in a video like this, but in this case it's first off 86 pages long, and it is absolutely necessary to understand, to figure out how to get all of these things to work together. So when you first get the gun you have to actually synchronize, well you have to mate the gun to the watch. Now that had already been done, by this pistol's owner, so I didn't have to deal with that when I got it. However, the batteries were both low to the point of potentially dying while I took it out to the range, so I figured I needed to change the batteries. And uh, the process of changing the batteries and then getting the gun to work took me close to an hour uh, of reference with the manual and working back and forth with the watch and the pistol. So the watch has a standard sort of watch coin battery, a CR2032. Uh, That's pretty easy to replace. The pistol has a pair of AAA batteries under the grip safety or the actuation lever. It's sort of a grip safety, but it does more than a typical grip safety. So let's start. If I haven't done anything with the watch, we'll just put it out of frame here. We have a pistol that has an LED in the back, and that's pretty cool. The colors on this, by the way, are completely perfectly backwards to any other firearm you will basically ever find, because red means uh, that it will not fire, and green means that it will fire. So normally we're used to red meaning not safe, red, danger, ready to fire. In this case, red means ain't nothing gonna happen. Uh, we have a double action trigger, this is hammer fired. Uh, it has a very stiff trigger pull in double action. There's a safety in the trigger. That safety works simply when you, you push it to the left side like this, it now runs into the frame when you try to pull the trigger. So that's how the manual safety works. There's our marking on the slide, the Armotics IP1 Smart System. Then we have Armotics Inc, which is the American subsidiary that did the importing in LA of all places. And uh, this is one time when you actually wouldn't have to put read manual before use on the side of the gun, because I guarantee you if you don't read the manual you're not going to be able to use the gun. It takes a little bit of uh, finagling to figure out how to actually make this thing work. I already mentioned that the sights are terrible for a target pistol. Well there's your front sight, and there's your rear sight. The front's square, the rear is trapezoidal, they are not adjustable, they are both molded. Uh, into the top strap of the pistol, so yeah, not something suitable for competition use. It's just a simple blowback 22, does lock open on an empty magazine there. Uh, the slide here is steel inside of like a plastic covering. The magazine release is German here, you can definitely an HK guy developed this. It's an ambidextrous lever, so it's on, well it's one lever that extends on both sides of the trigger guard. Pop that down, magazine comes out, this holds 10 rounds of 22 rimfire. Note that now that the magazine is out, the LED shows blue if I go and depress the grip safety. Blue indicates that, uh, well the magazine's out. It does have a magazine safety built into it electronically, so it won't fire with the magazine released, uh, removed, even if it is authenticated by the watch. By the way, the double action trigger pull is like it's heavy to the point that there are some people who would not actually be able to physically pull that trigger. Alright, now for disassembly what we do is push this little button in, and that allows me to slide this front piece off. There was an optional uh, device that they planned on releasing, but of course never did, that would be a USB connector you could use to update the firmware of the gun, and this is where it would have attached. Once that's off we have a little lever here that uh, this piece holds it in the upward position. Uh, honestly I don't know why this thing is blinking. I'll, I, I have no idea why it's blinking occasionally, but um, 
once this covers off, this piece comes down under spring pressure, and then I can disassemble it simply by pulling the slide back up and off, pretty typical of a simple blowback pistol. Got a recoil spring around the barrel. Mechanically speaking, the gun is pretty simple. It is hammer fired, so we've got a firing pin right back there, but pressing that firing pin does not cause it to protrude. That's it right there. It doesn't protrude out the front of the breech face because there is a firing pin block. And it's the electronic section that will eventually, through a series of steps, uh, disable the firing pin block. So what happens first is mechanical, and that is this top plunger here gets pushed in. Now that is actually done by this lug on the trigger bar. So as I pull the trigger about halfway forward, it's going to hit that plunger, push it up into the slide, which is going to cause this other plunger to push down out of the slide. Now this one is magnetic, and we have an electromagnet right here inside the frame of the gun. When this electromagnet is energized, pushing this plunger down is going to get this guy close enough to this that the magnet will pull it down and stick it here. And it's that little bit of extra travel that disables the firing pin block. So if I just hold this thing down, like so, I'm pushing the firing pin at the back and it's still not coming out the breech face. But if I gently grab it with a pair of pliers, I can pull it out just a little bit farther, and that is now enough for the firing pin to protrude and fire. Hopefully that's visible, it's a little hard to show this without three hands. So the basic sequence is when I depress the grip safety here, I'm going to close an electrical connection. The pistol is now going to inquire to the watch via radio signal whether or not it is authorized to fire, and the watch is going to respond back. We'll get to how you work with the watch in a moment. As assuming, well, if the answer is negative, then the electromagnet doesn't get energized, and pulling the trigger doesn't do enough to get that uh, block out of the way, and the gun doesn't fire. If the pistol is authorized to fire, that electromagnet is energized, it pulls the firing pin block the rest of the way, and when I pull the trigger all the way the hammer fires and is able to fire the pistol. So that's the basic process. Now let's take a look at the watch. We want step 6 here, activating the IP1 pistol, which is page 28. We'll skip past all of this. Here's the essential bit. I'm going to first hit the bottom right button on the watch to move it into gun mode, then I'm going to hold the top uh, right button for three seconds, then I have to enter the pin of the gun. Happily, the gun includes a pair of uh, hard plastic cards that have the various identifying codes. The super pin and the weapon pin are used for initially pairing the gun to a watch, and then the pin for this particular gun is 2222. Two, two, two. Two. All right, bottom button there puts me into gun mode. Now I'm going to press and hold this for three seconds. Now it's going to prompt me for the pin. One, two, three, and four. This is two, 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 two. Fortunately, it's a very easy pin. It comes back good. Now I have to tell it how long I want to authorize shooting. So I can go two hours, three, four, we'll just do three hours and accept. All right, and now I have a little picture of the gun in my watch face. There we go. Uh, when I engage the grip safety, the gun is green and ready to fire. I'll point out again that green is not the color we would expect to indicate a ready to fire status in the US, but the people who designed this were, well, the guy who designed it was a gun guy, but anyway, someone made the decision that green means it's ready to fire. And you'll notice that the grip of the gun filled up solid there. That's because I put new batteries in it, and that indicates that it has a full battery charge. Uh, by the way, the watch can also do a couple other things typical of digital watches. I've got there's a stopwatch mode in it and an alarm mode, but the only reason you would wear this thing is so that it will let you shoot your pistol. One other thing that I need to show you is how to change the batteries in your gun. Not something you normally have to do. So you take the magazine out, and then you just push out this little cross pin. 
This, by the way, is a disassembly tool that comes with the pistol. This pin is intended to be easily removable, so you don't need a, a punch or a tap or anything, it's just easy to push out. And it's uh, held in place by the back of the magazine floor plate when the magazine's in. With that pin out, I can pull the back strap off, and voila, we have the little LED is right there, two AAA batteries. It is worth pointing out that there is nothing actually waterproofing this deal. So I would not recommend using this uh, in the rain. Like when the hammer is down, you've basically just got a funnel here that goes straight into the electronics of the gun. I don't know that anyone's ever really tested that because there were never enough of these brought on the market for anyone to do substantial testing with. But um, when you uh, change, if you need to change the batteries, you then have to go through a separate process to resynchronize the pistol with the watch, which is, let's see, there we go, uh, synchronizing the time between the IP1 pistol and the IW1 wristwatch. And then there's also all sorts of stuff for resetting the pin if you want to, and etc, etc. Now that I've reassembled the pistol, we should be good to go, except of course when I squeeze the grip safety I'm going to get blue because there's no magazine in it. Put in the magazine, now it should go green, there we go. Starts red, authenticates with the watch, turns green, now we're good to go. If I take the watch and move it away from my body, now it's red. Bring the watch back, and it turns green. So that's the concept of the Armadix IP1. It took a while for the IP1 to actually be developed. From about 2006 when Malk uh, joined the company and started working on it, it wouldn't be until late 2013 that the pistol was introduced in the US. And of course, as one would expect, it made a fair amount of uh, media splash, especially not just within the firearms media, but in the general media as well. Uh, it was actually available for sale, or it was supposed to be, it was going to be in early 2014. There was one particular shooting range in California that had basically signed on uh, to have a demo range and kind of be the center of media evaluation and you know we'll do some demos of it and we'll help sell them. Apparently they had not initially realized what the consequences were going to be if this was deemed uh, a smart pistol under New Jersey law, because it appears that someone told them, and pretty much overnight, before the gun actually became available, they memory hold the entire project. Uh, they took down all the signs, they pulled any pistols that they may have had on the shelf, it's unclear if they ever actually had guns like on the shelf to sell, but they pulled them off, and uh, basically the news media story was, no, we were never going to sell this, this was all overblown by the company rep, yeah there's a picture of it like in a display case, that was taken without our understanding, uh, totally never going to happen, uh, go look somewhere else. And there were a couple other dealers who showed an interest in selling these things and were seriously bullied out of doing so, to the point of death threats, like people took this really seriously. Now, interestingly, in uh, one of the gun control uh, lobbying groups actually sued New Jersey uh, to force them to deliver a report as required by their by this smart gun law, deliver a report on whether or not this pistol was a smart gun. This lawsuit was filed, obviously hoping that it would be considered one and thus would trigger this law. In late 2014, the New Jersey Attorney General actually came, came out with a determination that this pistol did not meet the criteria of that New Jersey law, basically because it could be fired by an unauthorized user, because it could be fired by anybody who had the watch close to it. So if you weren't the authorized user, but you stole the watch and the pistol, well you could still shoot the gun. Therefore, it didn't meet the requirements of the law or the specifications of the law, therefore this gun, whether it's available or not, doesn't trigger that cascading effect in New Jersey. But that didn't matter at the time, people weren't paying much attention to that, uh, they were simply making sure that nobody was willing to sell this thing. There is a combination of concern, uh, legitimate concern I would say, over that New Jersey law being triggered, and also an absolute knee-jerk uh, reaction, negative reaction to any level of computerized uh, technology 
being put into firearms. There are a lot of people who have a very significant distrust of anything that technologically advanced, even if it is an incredibly simple electrical circuit, uh, being put into firearms. And you can see the same sort of thing with, for example, Remington's attempt to introduce electronic primed, or electronic, well, electrically primed, electrically firing rifles, the, the Remington e-tronics, uh, was a complete flop for reasons that significantly overlap the issues here. People, so many people just don't want anything electronic in the firearm. There is a really significant value placed on the idea that it is a purely mechanical device that is immune to the, the wiles of the modern world and it simply put ammo gun work. Nothing more substantial than that. So uh, <laughs> the company back in 2016 had, there was a big media uh, fluff that the company was going to be releasing its second pistol, a nine millimeter pistol, I think intended for the police that would actually use fingerprint authentication. As best I can tell, that thing never actually entered the United States. Uh, interestingly, Malk, the designer, was, I believe, CEO of Armadix when this pistol came out. And not long after this pistol came out, he was very quietly uh, let go from the company completely without any real explanation, but it seems pretty obvious explanation is this thing cratered so hard and so badly and so predictably anyone could have been able to tell this company that this was not going to be a successful commercial release in the United States, but they went ahead and did it anyway, presumably lost a significant amount of money, and they uh, took the designer and just out he goes. So that is the story of the Armadix IP-1. Apparently, basically the only guns that ever came into the country were the ones that were initially brought in for like marketing and demonstration purposes. There's very few of them. This particular one is a very early serial number. Uh, it's one of those guns. And uh, a big thanks to the viewer who loaned it to me, who apparently found it on some online auction for next to nothing, which is super cool. Um, yeah, been a lot of fun taking a look at this. Now I'm really excited to get this thing out to the range. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and do that tomorrow. I actually have not fired it yet myself. So uh, the suspense is real. We'll see how it actually does on the range. Stick around and check out that video tomorrow. Hopefully you enjoyed this one. Thank you for watching.